Okay, so in this video, we are talking about the purposes of collaboration, what collaboration aims to do and why we choose it for certain problems over other ones, because there are some things where cooperation is totally fine, or at least non-collaborative cooperation is totally fine. Uh, collaboration might just kind of get in the way. But there are also other times where collaboration is necessary, and this video aims to identify what those times are and sort of contextualize them. So the overview is um, the four primary purposes of collaboration are to become informed, to make decisions, to solve problems, and to manage projects. I'll go into each of these in a little more detail. So when working alone, two people will form different information from the same data. So if two people are working on tasks and they get the same kind of information or knowledge or data or whatever, they might come to very different conclusions. It's very easy for two people to come to different conclusions based on the same data. And when working on a relatively complicated project, this could mean that two people have different ideas about what solution needs to be done or what course of action needs to be taken or what changes need to be made to a product or any of that sort of thing. So if they were just working separately, affecting, you know, trying to work together on the same end goal in a group but kind of doing their work independently from each other with no input from each other uh, they might end up going in contradicting directions and that could be disastrous for the project as a whole so collaboration between members of a group ensures that the team conceives the same information everybody in the team might start off drawing different conclusions from the same piece of data that they're all working with. And that part is totally fine, it's natural, and it's actually a benefit of collaboration. But collaboration also has them all coming together to give feedback and to try to figure out what the best, uh, the best thing to do might be. And it's in that point where they all come together that is so fundamental to collaboration, that's where they all get on the same page. They'll recognize that they all have a different idea of what's going on, come together to work through that, and ideally leave whatever you know meeting that they were doing in order to figure that all out. They will leave that meeting with the same knowledge, the same idea of where to go from there. Everybody will be on the same page page. So that is what collaboration can give over non-collaborative cooperation where people might be working more independently and might not have that kind of communication. Now collaboration can also facilitate making decisions. Uh, everyone can come together to make decisions on what direction to take in order to achieve a certain goal. But you know, there's different levels of decisions that might actually need to be made at any given point. And collaboration might not be great for every single type of decision. So let's look at the different levels of decisions that we have. Now, operational decisions are relatively simple questions that can be answered and they support day-to-day -day operational activities. Um, an example that uh, might be considered an operational decision, if you are signing up for your classes and you have a particular class in mind that you want to take, trying to figure out which section of a class to take might be considered an operational decision. Um, another example might be if you are grocery shopping, you already have your budget in mind, and you already have your list of groceries, asking yourself the questions of, should I get this particular item? Might be operational. 
or making the choice between multiple brands of a particular item might be operational. So they're relatively, relatively simple decisions um, by themselves, and there might be uh, a lot of problems that need to be solved or uh, jobs that need to be done that involve answering a ton of operational decisions decisions very, very quickly, um, which is a skill in and of itself if you're dealing with um, hundreds of operational decisions a day. Regardless, uh, that is an operational decision. Managerial decisions, on the other hand, involve the allocation and utilization of resources. So, with the groceries example, that might have something to do with, you know, I need to figure out what my budget for this particular grocery trip will be. Um, maybe, you know, you have a need to buy a whole bunch of stuff in bulk and because of that, it's okay for this particular grocery trip to be a little heavier in the budget and the remaining grocery trip, or to have a little bit heavier of a budget and the next few grocery trips to have a lighter budget because you're getting these bulk items that will then be used over a long period of time, whereas the other grocery items are more, you know, the ones that you need to get very frequently, like milk, uh, fruits, vegetables, all that kind of stuff that could perish very easily. So thinking that kind of thing, the, the, those kinds of decisions might be managerial. Another managerial decision would be uh, the head of a department assigning certain professors to teach certain classes. Those are managerial because they would be allocating certain resources to cover classes that need to be taught. Um, the allocation and utilization of those resources would be uh, figuring out which uh, professors are available to teach, um, which classes they are able to teach, because some professors can teach some classes and some professors can teach other classes, uh, and then actually putting everything in place, making the puzzle come together. So that'd be managerial. I think you could also make the case that figuring out what classes to take in a particular semester would be managerial. Uh, less of a resources type of thing, but when you're taking classes, you might have a list of certain classes you need in order to get a particular degree or certificate that you're going after. And you sort of need to put everything in place. You need to figure out what order of classes that you need to take. You know, some classes can be taken concurrently. Some classes are prerequisites of other classes, so they need to be done first and relatively early on, um, and so on and so forth. So that could be considered managerial. And then there's the strategic decisions, which support broad organizational issues as a whole. Um, these might be a little bit tougher to think about here, uh, just because they can be relatively high level, but we'll see if any of these examples help. So a strategic decision might be a college as a whole deciding to add a new series of classes, like a, a new department to that college in order to facilitate a, speci a specific type of education. So this isn't just like allocating teachers and all that kind of stuff. This is setting up the framework for an entirely new set of classes to be taught. Allocating building space would be a part of this. Um, hiring new professors to teach everything. 
uh, getting students invested in this uh, new department and the courses that the new department is offering and the degrees and certificates that you can get through this new department, all that kind of stuff. Those are all possibly like managerial decisions and or operational decisions that come from the result of this. But the decision to add a new department would be strategic. It involves the long-term strategy of Alan Hancock choosing to teach those types of classes. Uh, and this would be made by considering costs and benefits of adding all these new classes, of trying to figure out the building space for this department, all that kind of stuff. There would be a lot that goes into it. Uh, which is why it's so broad. But it's a strategic decision because it's working with the organization's strategy as a whole. As a student, a strategic decision you might make could be what degree or certificate am I going to try to obtain at the college? If you're even going to, and choosing not to obtain a specific degree or specific certificate and just to take classes, that in and of itself would also be a strategic decision. But making those types of decisions on your educational path through Alan Hancock, that would be strategic. Those would all be strategic decisions, and those would then lead to a whole bunch of managerial and operational decisions as a consequence. But you all have made these big strategic decisions. I think even you could say that simply coming to Alan Hancock could count as a, as a strategic decision. It supports a broad um it supports a broad issue that you have. And I, I don't mean issue as in something is wrong, but rather like a big thing that is happening in your life. Maybe you're trying to do something in particular with the education that you're getting at Allen Hancock. That would count. Uh, if you have a very long-term goal of, let's say, opening up a business or being more familiar with computers so you are able to talk to relatives that live on the other side of the country, or all that kind of stuff. Those are broad, in this case, this would count as a broad organizational issue if you count as an organization under this definition. I, I know I'm kind of stretching things here, but I would count that as all of that as being a strategic decision to get education from Alan Hancock. Now we also have the idea of the decision process. It's the process by which we go about making a decision. No matter what type of decision that it is, whether it's organizational, managerial, or strategic, when you actually make that decision, you are going through some sort of process to come to the actual de decision itself. You start with a question or an issue that needs to be solved or something like that, you go through a process and you end with a decision that hopefully solves that issue. Now there's gonna be two types of decision processes that we're talking about here. The first is structured. Um, you are dealing with an issue here where there is a very understood method for actually making that decision. You come across a problem and you have a pretty cut and dry solution for how to actually solve that problem. For example, with the groceries example, right? Uh, if you have a very specific budget and you have a list of groceries that you're trying to get, if the problem is, should I get this item and the item is not on the list, maybe your structured decision process is, if it's not on the list, don't get it. In which case, you can apply that process to make the operational decision of, you know, whether or not you're going to get it. You decide, no, I'm not going to get this particular item. It is not on my list. You might also have a structured decision process for how to decide between 
two uh, items, two brands of the same product in the store. Now, I don't know what that might necessarily be for you. For me personally, when I'm shopping at a grocery store and I see two things that are from different brands, but they're otherwise pretty comparable and one is cheaper, uh, my structured decision process might be if I don't already know that the cheaper product is really bad, then get the more expensive one. Otherwise, get the cheaper one. That might be my particular process that I use for a lot of things. And of course, you know, it might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, there might be a lot of other steps to this process, but as long as there is a defined process where I can sort of go through everything step by step, I go through a process and by the end I have a concrete decision that I'm satisfied with because I'm satisfied with the process. That would be a structured decision process. Now, on the other hand, an unstructured decision process is a process uh, for making a decision that doesn't necessarily have a set agreed upon decision making method. So there isn't some set of steps that you're following in order to come across this decision that you're trying to make. Instead, you kind of have to figure it out, maybe go through an iteration process, maybe not, but you're going through and you're figuring it out for yourself without relying on this specific set of steps. An example for this is, um, let's say when you are trying to figure out in what order you should take your classes. Maybe you already know what classes you need to take in order to get to reach your educational goals. But you need to figure out the order in which to take them. And you have your, prereq your prerequisites, which you need to figure, you know, you need to uh, maintain that order. It's very important to follow the prerequisites of a series of courses. You also have other classes that may not have prerequisites, um, and those need to be taken. Like, you know, general education might not have, not some of those classes might not have prerequisites. Uh, so they might be able to be placed a little more freely in your ordering of classes. But, um, you know, you have this list of classes as well as this list of prerequisites, and you need to figure out how to order those classes so you know which classes to take during which semester or which term or whatever. Going about solving that problem while also making sure that you are staying within uh, the, you know, credit limits or staying within your limits for how much you can handle between the number of classes you're taking and whatever else is going on in your life. Trying to maintain all of those is a tricky, tricky problem. And it might be possible to make some algorithm, to make some series of steps that you can follow in order to figure that out, but it might not be, or you might not feel like doing it. And if you don't have that knowledge and you go about it by just starting to order your classes and seeing if you can make something that works. That would be an unstructured decision process. Now, as we get broader and broader in scope with our decisions, we tend to move towards an unstructured de decision process more and more and more. So operational decisions tend to be structured. Strategic decisions tend to be unstructured and managerial decisions could be either. It could go either way, sometimes. Um, this isn't universal, per se. Sometimes there are best practices for solving big strategic decisions. Sometimes operational decisions uh, show up or need to be made when there is no precedent to follow. 
sometimes all of that stuff can happen. But in general, we have this sort of idea where operational tends to be a little more structured and strategic tends to be a little more unstructured. And as we move towards unstructured decision processes, as we move away from the world where we know the best way to solve particular problems and into the world where we're kind of paving new ground, we don't necessarily know the best method of solving problems, right? As we go in that direction, towards managerial, towards strategic, towards unstructured, that's where collaboration becomes more and more important. So collaboration can benefit us in making decisions, especially these very broad, unstructured decisions. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about one of the purposes of collaboration being decision making is that it helps us make these very complicated decisions, solve these very complicated problems. And hey, speaking of solving problems, uh, collaboration helps us solve problems. Uh, a problem is a perceived difference between what is and what ought to be. You have the current situation where you're at, and you have the situation that you want to be in, and you have to figure out how to go from where you're at to where you want to be. And oftentimes collaboration can help with that. It helps you actually not just figure out how to do it, but then actually go from where you're at to where you want to be. The tasks in solving a problem are defining the problem as explicitly as possible so you know exactly what needs to be solved. Then you identify all of the possible solutions that you can think of. When they're talking about alternative solutions, uh, they are alternatives to each other. So you pick all the possible ways in which you could solve this problem based on the work that you've done to define the problem. You just, you give yourself just a whole pile of alternatives that you could pick. Then what you want to do is you want to specify an evaluation criteria for those solutions. You want to specify a way in which you can determine which of these solutions is the best. So is the best solution the one that costs the least amount of money? Is it the one that takes the shortest amount of time? Is it the one that has a very delicate balance between time, money, and the number of people who have to work on it? All those kinds of things that you might have to um, figure out when you're working on your solution. So you specify specifically the way in which you can tell which one of the solutions is best. Once you have that evaluation criteria, you use that evaluation criteria to evaluate all the alternative, all the alternatives that you made. You take a look at each possible solution and say, how well does this hold up in terms of the evaluation criteria? From there, you figure out which one is best and you select that alternative. You select that solution and then you implement it. You actually go through and try to solve the problem. Now, there's always the possibility that uh, there are things that you didn't anticipate when you were defining the problem. So you left out some kind of aspect or when you were creating the solution, you didn't account for certain things. So this isn't 100% foolproof, but it gives you a really good idea of how you could possibly go about solving this problem. Like it, um, it will be a solid solution, even if unexpected things occur. And if the unexpected things are so bad that 
they make your solution completely uh, worthless. You know, that doesn't mean that you failed or something like that. Maybe you just start the problem over again with a better definition of the problem and you come up with better solutions involving those uh, unexpected things. But regardless, this problem solving, um, these tasks of problem solving are really helpful in coming up with a good solution. All right, and then finally we have project management. Collaboration can facilitate the management of a project. Um, projects are used to create or produce something and the management of a project can be really helpful in making sure that that project stays on task and is completed ideally within the monetary and time budgets that it's given. So we have the project management tasks and the data that all of those tasks use. So when you're starting out with an actual project, um, what you do is you set the team authority, you figure out if someone is a leader, you figure out who is in charge of what aspects of certain uh, parts of the project, all that kind of stuff. You're setting your scope and budget, uh, forming the team, establishing responsibilities and the rules that you're going to follow as a team. And the shared data that they're talking about here, this is data that is used in order to actually accomplish the starting phase of the project management. Um, the team member personal data and startup documents. Uh, so, you know, ways for everyone in the team to get in contact with each other and then the starting documents that everyone can reference as they work on their pieces of the project. Then people start planning. So they determine the tasks that need to be done and the dependencies, the uh, prerequisite tasks for other tasks, because sometimes you need to accomplish thing A before you can accomplish thing B. You assign the tasks, you determine the schedule, and you might have to revise the budget at this point as you get a better idea of the tasks that need to actually be completed. Um, the actual plan and budget of the project will be shared with everyone within the team so they know what's going on. They have an overall sense of the, the total plan of the project. They can look at everything from a bird's eye view and they can see how much money everyone's got to work on specific tasks and all that kind of stuff. Then after planning, people actually start doing. So they'll perform the tasks, they'll manage the budget and the actual tasks as they do it. Uh, so they're solving problems. We talked a whole bunch about that. Reschedule tasks when they need to, uh, if things are taking too long, or if they uh, finish something quicker than they thought they would. Uh, so they'll, they'll schedule something a little bit sooner, possibly. And they're documenting and reporting their progress so people know what's being done and can sort of uh, allocate their own budgets and time and tasks and that kind of stuff in response. And then you'll have things like a uh, list of tasks that need to be done, tasks that have been done, tasks that are in progress. You update the budget as you spend money, you update the schedule as you complete tasks or if tasks run a little bit long. Uh, and then you have uh, reports on how things are going in your particular area. And then finally, you finish everything, everything off. So you say, hey, we have completed this project. Uh, the archival documents are essentially going to be documents that talk about what the project was, what people did in order to make that project, uh, different aspects of the project that could be useful in the future. Uh, things like the budget, the amount of money that was actually used compared to the budget, the schedule compared to the amount of time they initially set out to do everything. Uh, share those documents within the team and then possibly disband if that's necessary. Uh, maybe the team will continue to do other work in the future. Regardless, that is the purposes of collaboration right there. The, uh, the major purposes of collaboration.